That'll teach me not to sit in the right seat. <laughs> Choir, nice to have you here this morning. Welcome, welcome. Pathfinders, Pathfinders, it's nice to have you here this morning. Yeah, and your leader. Let's see if I can get these names right because they're not names I'm used to saying every week. But your leader is a lady named Bless Cahoon. Is that right? Did I say it right? Yes. All right. And then your, the assistant director is Awe Terra Tierra. Is that right? Yes. Did I say it right? Yeah, good. All right. Thank you for being here. We have the Pathfinders here. They are based at the Edmonds Church. And I know that some of you folks are from the Green Lake Church. Wave your hand, Oliver. Are any of you from someplace other than the Edmonds Church? Where are you from? What? What church? Forest Park Church. Edmonds. All right. Oh, you're from Green Lake. From Limwood. Who's from Limwood? Ah, sweet. Thank you for being here today. We are delighted that you are here. And Bless and Awe and all the folks that make this club work, thank you for your work. <clears throat> okay, let's see. We have some other announcements to share with you here. Softball. Softball is a very important ministry. It is proof that a person is alive if they play softball. You, know, you have to stand up, you have to run, you have to swing a bat, you have to interact with other human beings. It's almost like church. So softball is in session. The first game for our award-winning team will be May 21. So that's what, a week from tomorrow? So if you are interested in playing softball, especially if you're a woman, please talk to Fia or Ken. Uh, information is in the bulletin. Very important. This, this is an absolutely vital ministry of the church. Play softball. And if you don't want to play, it's okay. They need spectators. What better way to spend an afternoon in Seattle than at a ballpark watching people you love run the bases? I mean... It's just way cool. Oh, wow. This is serious competition. So next Sunday, you have a choice. You could go to the softball game at 5 o'clock. Or at 3 o'clock, you could go to the concert featuring Charlotte Ishikawa. Now there, and maybe if you went to the concert and then went really fast. You could get to the game, and you could do both. Information's in your bulletin. And just thinking ahead, a week after next Sunday, May 27, our first hike, um, one of the doctrines peculiar, the 29th doctrine of the Green Lake Church is thou shalt hike on Sabbath afternoon. <laughs> and then there's a subset, a sub-doctrine that says, and thou shalt hike with other Green Lakers. So, here it is, your chance to observe fundamental belief number 29. You heard it first here on, um, that's Sabbath, that's not Sunday. Sabbath, May 27 at Coal Creek Park. And uh, this is actually kid-friendly. This is not a marathon. This is a nice, easy hike. Hope you can do it. All right. Terry, oh, wait a minute, no, I'm saving you. Saving you for later. All right, we did that. I'm going to ask you, look at the other announcements in the bulletin, especially the announcements that say that we're looking for employees, both at Cypress Adventist School and here at Green Lake Church. There are some positions that pay a little bit of money uh, we need people for, and you may not be perfect for the job, but you may know someone who is. So I hope you would take a minute, look at that, and if somebody comes to mind and you're going, oh, I should tell so-and-so about this, Please help us uh, network these positions because we've been advertising them for a little while and as far as I know, right now we don't have a bunch of candidates. So would you, would you do that for us? Look at those positions that are advertised and help us spread the word. 
Now I'm going to invite you to stand, greet one another, pass God's peace here in God's house. I'll invite you to find your seats. We have two other announcements. Uh, Brian, why don't you come on up and talk to us a little bit about Mary's Place? All right. First of all, I'd like to thank those of you who have contributed to Mary's Place. Uh, for those of you who don't know, over the last couple months, We've been collecting donated goods, used or new items uh, for a, an outreach, com community outreach program called Mary's Place. It's here in Seattle. And they mostly focus on women and children who are in crisis situations, uh, homeless, and the purpose of their ministry is to get them back on their feet and back to living a normal life. Um, so once again, thanks for those of you who have donated. The can that we have out front to collect the donations in, it'll be out there for one more week. So next Sabbath will be the last Sabbath. And also like to say thank you to Greg and Safio. They kind of spearheaded this and they've been delivering the donations. Um, so if you would like to make donations after next week, you're always welcome to go to Mary's place and check it out and see what the, um, what the ministry is all about. But once again, next week will be the last week we're gonna be collecting for them. So, thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Aiden. <laughs> and Terry, uh, you have something to share. Um, this sort of follows up on what John was saying about the hike as well. But I'm curious how many of you received a newsletter. Can you raise your hand? You might have received it in email or regular paper copy. And if you're not one of the people raising your hand that you received uh, the newsletter, there are some in the rack on the back wall, they're purple. Um, but also, perhaps you're not on the church email list. So if you're not on the church email list or would like to, um, or would like to receive a paper copy because you don't do email, you can take out one of those cards in the pews and just write a note on it saying, I'd like to be on the church's email list so I can receive the newsletter. And that's important because not only does it mention the May 27th hike, but it gives the schedule for all the hikes this summer. So, and you don't want, you want to be sure and add those to your calendar so you can join the hikes. But also, there's also a notice about volunteers needed. So I, since I was the one that put in those notices, I wanna make sure that everybody's aware that we do have um, openings for service in the church, and in particular in the education division. 
Um, we're looking for people who could perhaps organize some outings and some gatherings for the various Sabbath school divisions. And also we're gonna be down one um, junior teacher when Lita moves away, sadly. Um, so th please read your newsletter, look at those opportunities and see if you feel called to help us with those ministries. Thank you. Some of you will remember that Jesus uh, one time held the crowd all day long, and then near the end of the day, he told the disciples he was worried that if the people went home without eating, they might faint along the way. Well, we at Green Lake Church take the example of Jesus seriously. So for one of these hikes, at the end of the hike, there will be ice cream because we don't want you to faint before you get home. I mean, we, we do things right. So make sure you go on the hike because you wouldn't want to show up for ice cream and not be hungry. Um, hope you'll look at that schedule and I uh, hope you'll join us for some hikes this summer. Now, um, I invite you to open your hearts uh, as the choir calls us into worship. Let's pray. Lord of creation, thank you for the burst of life we experience here in spring. Lord of the cosmos, we pray that you will order all things far and near according to your good pleasure. Lord of the nations, hasten the day when swords will be beaten into plowshares and justice will pour down like a river. Lord of our hearts, so mold and shape us that in the week to come we may act as agents of your kingdom to bring hope and help and healing. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Happy Sabbath. Um, our offering this, this morning is for Adventist World Ministries. So I want to encourage our members to give uh, in response to how much God has given you to support these ministries worldwide. May the deacons please stand. Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for giving us this opportunity, dear Lord, to be part of the ministry worldwide. Encourage us as we give. May you multiply the gifts that we return to you. In your name we pray. Amen.
Hi guys, good morning. Uh, do you know it's a special day tomorrow? Do you know what's gonna happen? Mother's Day. That's right. So we're gonna do a little acting. So can our mother come forward, please? This is our pretend mother. <laughs> okay, can I have a volunteer from the audience? You, come here. Can you please like shake her leg and say, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, over and over again. <laughs> okay, that's good. Stay here. Can I have another volunteer? Yeah, in the back to us. Okay, on her other leg, can you say, I'm bored, I'm bored, over and over again? <laughs> good, stay there. Another volunteer? Yes. Can you say, can you tuck on her arm and say, I want to go play, over and over? <laughs> That's good. Okay, one more volunteer. You? Come on. Now, can you pull on her other arm saying, she took my toy? over and over. Okay, can everybody do their thing at the same time? Okay? <laughs> okay, that's enough. Everybody can return to their seats. So, how does it feel to be a mother? Annoying. <laughs> so, mothers have a really hard job, and tomorrow we're supposed to appreciate them. So, Everybody should be a little nicer to them and be more patient. Yeah. So, you can. Get your buckets, kids. Go get your buckets.
Our Father in heaven, we thank you once more, dear Lord, for gathering us here from all walks of life to worship you and to show our gratitude, dear Lord, for the many things that you give to us. Thank you, Father, for providing health. Thank you, Lord, for many blessings, dear Lord, that we have, and thank you for our families. We pray, Father, that, Lord, you will be with us, dear Lord, as we receive from you this morning. In our midst, Father, we, we have the sick. We present them, O oh Lord, before you, that, Lord, you alone will anoint them, touch them, dear Lord, and make them well. We pray for Julie. We pray for Ryan. We pray for Theda. We pray for John. And we pray also for members and a mother of, with addiction in our midst, and many others, dear Lord, that are not on the list. Father, we also want to thank you, Father, for the pathfinders in our midst today. Thank you for the, for, the, for the service that they are providing to us. We pray, Lord, that you continue, oh Father, providing them wisdom, guidance, oh Lord, and that you give us the strength as family members of oh Father and community to support them in their quest, oh Father, to, to work for you. Father, we present our pastor who is speaking to us this morning, that, Lord, you prepare him, O oh Lord, as you speak through him to us, that he, you may help us, O oh Father, understand how we can partner with you, how we can be there, O oh Lord, in instruments that you can communicate your love through, O oh Lord, to the community that we serve and the community where we live. Be with the Adventist World Church, O oh Father, wherever, Lord, they are. Thank you, Father, for being there, for being so good to us. We pray, Lord, that your will be done always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from the first chapter of Daniel, verses 1 through 4. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon.
The New Testament reading is from Mark 9, verses 17 through 27. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, You faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion, and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, Since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers were, was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak, he said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran to the, through the crowd as people said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet, and he stood up. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word.
I was sitting on a stool in the rain on the dock across the street at Green Lake. Thursday morning. I looked down the lake south, and I can see coming out from the boathouse area a racing shell. I knew what to expect. That's, uh, there's a crew that trains on Green Lake. I didn't think much about it. Then they got closer, and I noticed, I was kind of surprised, the boat was not full. There were, I don't know, five or six, as I recall, um, young ladies. Uh, pulling at the oars. I looked at my, well, I pulled my phone out. What time is it? Started to say I looked at my watch. I'm, who has a watch? I pulled my phone out. It was 5.56. And I'm thinking, wow, this is dedication. I'm, I'm guessing they must have showed up for practice at like 5.30 in the rain, in the gray, and now they're rowing hard in this shell. And then a most amazing thing. You won't believe this. I mean, you're not going to believe this. Chasing them in a motorboat was a woman who was yelling at them. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. These girls are rowing at 5.56 in the morning, in the rain, and some woman in a motorboat is chasing them, yelling at them. We'll come back to that later. <laughs> Our Old Testament reading tells the story that every parent loves, because this is my kid. You have these four kids. They're put into an academic program. They've got three years to do what they've got to do. And at the end, they're 10 times smarter than everybody else. And they go, that's my kids. Yep. And a whole bunch of you are thinking, yep, that's my kids. Smart, beautiful, good, impressive, better than your kids. Moms love that. Do you know what my kid did? Did you hear what my kid got on the test? We love that. Then there's other stories in the Bible that we identify with, but they're not so pretty. Two stories in the Gospels that I especially like. We had the one today that featured a dad. Almost the same story is told in the Gospels, and it's a mom. A mom and her daughter, a dad and his son, and it's the story that parents don't want to identify with but we can't help it. We feel it deep in the core of our being. The story we heard in the New Testament reading today, a dad has a son who is possessed by a demon, is the way it's told there. The exact nature of the malady, we don't know. It doesn't matter. But the son's life is, is horrific. Seizures of whatever kind, throw him in the fire and burn him, throw him into the water and drown him. And at the end of the story, after Jesus has spoken the word, and the sun is on the ground still, and the crowd wonders if he has died, because that would be the expected outcome of the life of somebody in that situation. And then the boy stands to his feet and the crowd bursts into applause and the dad is just euphoric. His son is alive and everything is okay. Right now, his son does not need to get an A in school. He doesn't have to practice the piano. He doesn't have to wash the dishes. He doesn't have to clean his room. He doesn't have to be nice to his brother. Just take another breath. And this dad is ecstatic. Then the story of the mom. I think it's my all-time favorite. You know the story. I've told it so often. The old people here, they're tired of hearing it because I just tell it over their week tries to go on vacation. Vacations are wonderful, and the whole point of going on vacation is to get away from work. 
get away from solving the problems of the world. Jesus goes on vacation. He goes north up toward the town of Sidon, takes his disciples. They get a VRBO up there. It's quiet. It's peaceful. It's restful. Ah, lovely. They come out the door one morning, and there's a woman standing there, and she starts following them down the street. Hey, uh, Jesus, Jesus, please have mercy. Jesus, please, please. And Jesus and the disciples going down the road, and she keeps hollering at him, please have mercy, my daughter, my daughter, please. And the disciples finally turn to Jesus and say, would you get rid of this woman? She's driving us nuts. And Jesus says, I'm sorry, guys, I can't get rid of her. And they're thinking, what do you mean I can't get rid of her? Just tell her to go away. If this had been a dad, that would have worked. If Jesus had told a dad following him, pleading for the life of his son, and Jesus turned and said, look, you, mister, quit. He would have gone, oh. He would have been crushed, and we would have accepted the fact he had done all he could do. Moms, don't do that. Jesus could have hollered at her all afternoon. Leave me alone. And she'd have gone, I will not. Until you help my daughter, I'm going to be right here. Jesus, please have mercy on my daughter. My daughter, please, my daughter. You've got to save my daughter. So Jesus explains to the disciples he cannot get rid of the woman because his job is to help the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which is a fancy way of saying the Jewish people are my mission. That's who, the pe who God told me to help. God has not told me to help those people. And if I don't help her, she's not going to go away because she is a mother. As Jesus is explaining this, the mother, because he's not moving, pushes through the disciples, and now she's right in front of Jesus. And Jesus said, lady, look, I can't help you. It is not right to take the children's food and give it to the dogs. You're a dog. She says, it's all right. But only a jerk would begrudge a dog the crumbs. Jesus breaks into a smile and he says, honey, may it be according to your will. Only twice do we ever see Jesus bend his will to the will of another. Only twice. The story that the church has always told and celebrates most loudly is when Jesus bent his will to the will of the Father. The night before he was crucified, he prayed, God, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go through this. I can't handle it. I, I don't know if I can take it. Please, don't make me do it. And then Jesus says, in the classic words, not my will, but your will be done. He yielded to the will of the Father and he marched forward to the cross. This afternoon of this story, Jesus bends to the will of this mother. He has just told her, hey, it's not my plan to help you out. That wasn't part of the plan. The plan I had was to help the Jewish people and then later my disciples were going to take it to the world. This is, this is not on the calendar. But mom... May it be as you will. And the woman went home to a daughter who was well, recovered, restored. Recently, there have been some people kind of upset with me uh, as I have told this story because they said, no, that can't be true. Because you know good and well that Jesus was all the time meaning to heal that woman. I go, yeah, I know. Which tells us that when we read something that implies that the will of God is contrary to the will of a good mother, you didn't read it right. What is the highest and best will of God? what every mother wants for her child. Healing. Life. Success. Holiness. 
with all the things that every mother would want. That's what God wants. So it's appropriate at Mother's Day to talk about mothers in church. A good mother. And we know that not all humans are good at what they do. There are mothers that are not good mothers, and there are fathers that are not good fathers. <laughs> There's kids that are not good kids, believe it or not. <laughs> But in our minds, we are able to imagine what a perfect mother is like. And she would argue down even Jesus and win the argument if needed to save her kid. And guess what? That's what God's like. Who would God damn? Same people mom would damn. Not very many. I love the skit these kids did. I actually saw that at my house recently. My daughter-in-law was in the kitchen cooking. And there were two kids fighting over mom, each holding on to one leg, trying to get rid of the other kid off the other leg because I want mom all to myself. It was, it was kind of funny. Mom's trying to cook and two kids having World War III you know, each hug hanging on to one leg. <laughs> may that be a picture of us and God. And may we learn from that, that when we think we own God, we do. Just like every kid owns mother. And when you got six kids, boy, it really gets complicated as each claims to own mom. I mean, at least you only had four kids, and you had two legs and two arms, so that made it, you know, that was workable. You had a couple of more kids in there, and it really gets complicated as each wants to own mom, and each does own mom, but mom owns them all, yeah. Let's go back to the boat in the lake. These girls in this boat, is it disrespectful to call these young women girls? Get in trouble these days. These young women rowing this boat. It's 5.30 in the morning, in the rain. They're out there working hard. What's this woman doing who's driving the motorboat hollering at them? Do you guys know who that was? Who? It's a coach, of course. And the whole time they're rowing, you hear the coach going, you know, do this, do that, don't do this, calling them each, different ones by name. Hey, you... I didn't hear any of that. I just, I mean, I didn't hear the details. But I know what the coach was doing. The coach was telling them how to pull, how to sit, how to watch, how to cooperate, what not to do. Why on the earth is a coach hollering at these girls in the boat? Because the girls in the boat want to win. And the coach wants them to win. And so... No matter how well those girls perform in practice, the lady in the motorboat's gonna be hollering, telling them to do better. So if you look at this one way, you're going, hey, lady in the boat, back off. These girls are dedicated, they're up early in the morning, they're pulling hard. Back off! What are you what are you on them? What are you hollering at them for? She's hollering at them because she wants them to win. And they want to win. When this mother who came to Jesus and begged for him to heal her daughter, when she got home and the daughter got up out of bed or whatever, the, 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 it was obvious that now the girl did not have the problem she did before. The mom was absolutely ecstatic. Glory be, hallelujah, I've got my daughter back. My guess is it probably took her an hour before she said, now honey, I need you to go and clean your room. What, mom? Isn't it enough to just be alive? Honey, actually, no. Go clean your room. Some of you have come home with an A. And that night, you bring your report card home. You show it to your mom. You got an A. And that night, mom goes, uh, you got any homework? Oh, wait a minute. I just got an A. You got any homework? 
Do you do that extra credit? What's, my, what, what's up with mom? Why is he on your case when you already got an A? Because she loves you so much, she wants you to win, and then win better, and then win bigger, and then win faster. That's the way moms are. It's the way God is. When we know God as God really is, two things make perfect sense and they actually live comfortably together. Because these two things live comfortably and naturally together in a good mother. God says to us, you are mine, I adore you. I claim you, I treasure you, I save you. You are mine. Did you hear that? You are mine. And then God says, work harder, be purer, pursue holiness more vigorously. The kick in the pants and the embrace with God's arm. Isn't that what any good mother does? pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.